On your Tuesday episode of Locked on Raptors, the Raptors are halfway to completing the 3-0 comeback against the Philadelphia 76ers, and we will dig into how they managed to take down Philly in Philly without Fred Van Vliet. Pascal Siakam featured heavily, the defense was fantastic, and we'll also hand out some flowers to some Sixers who helped the Raptors cause last night as well, and we'll do it all with Jamar Hines from Raptors Republic. That's all coming up on today's episode of Locked on Raptors. Thanks for being here. You are Locked On Raptors, your daily Toronto Raptors podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to episode number 1166 of Locked On Raptors for Tuesday, April the 26th. I'm your host, Sean Woodley of RaptorsHQ.com. You can find me on Twitter, as always, at WoodleySean. You can find the show at Locked On Raptors. And of course, you can follow, subscribe to, rate, review the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. It is deeply appreciated when you take the time to support the show. And uh, you can also go to YouTube and subscribe to the video feed. Got tons of subs yesterday. It was nice to see. We got like 20 new people on board yesterday, pushing towards 2,000. So please go if you have yet to subscribe. Even if you're not going to watch the videos every day, just do it to help the show out. It's very much appreciated when you do that and uh, juice the stats, baby. Uh, And a big thank you, as always, for making us your first listen of the day. All right, on today's show, your Toronto Raptors are now down 3-2 to the Sixers with Game 6 back in Toronto on Thursday. Lots of time to ruminate, lots of time for the Sixers to contemplate what the hell went wrong for them. And a lot went right, of course, for your Raptors in Game 5 as well down in Philly and joining me to break it all down and dig into you know the wonderful performance of Pascal Siakam vision six foot nine being on full display and so much more is the wonderful Jamar Hines from Raptors Republic how's it going pal I'm pretty good I think this is the first time I've been on your show when the Raptors have won a game I know I've been here a couple (laughs) times after a loss and then I was here during the all-star break so this is a totally new vibe that I could totally get used to very glad to break with tradition for that today. <laughs> Super happy to have you here. And yeah, we're going to talk uh, at length, I think, in this game about what the Raptors defense did to the Sixers. We're going to talk about some Sixers who played a pretty serious part, taking the Tobias Harris role. As Tobias Harris continues to be really good for the Sixers, lots of other guys stepping into his shoes to fill in that sort of uh, the void, the vacuum that needs to be filled by a Sixer who is handing the Raptors over games. Uh, but let's begin, shall we, with, I, I think we got to start with Pascal Siak. And just the way the offense operated last night with him at the helm. No Fred Van Vliet, of course, and that is, of course, a hit. You know, even though he's been in a sort of uh, lesser state, if we're being kind, over the last couple months here, obviously his three-point shooting and just the spacing he offers is incredibly valuable. Even if he's not hitting them, teams care about those threes, and that creates extra space and all of that. Of course, the Raptors, without Fred, decide to lean fully into the new vision of Vision Six Foot Nine with Gary Trent Jr., the lone six foot five guy, like a little shrimp out there. Uh, <laughs> and you know, Siakam, I thought was just like as all encompassing as we've seen him. We've seen him all season long, kind of be the guy who operates the offense and sort of you know pulls the strings and pulls the levers and you know just uses his own gravity to great create looks for others. But it was kind of on a new level in this game, and I was just so blown away in particular watching the third quarter, Jamar, where it seemed like coming out of the half, you know, the Raptors were pretty dominant defensively. It seemed like the Sixers were threatening to, you know, frankly, get their shit together in that third quarter. You know, they were kind of, you know, parading to the rim a little bit. Tyrese Maxey was getting loose just a tiny little bit. But it seemed like every single time the Sixers pulled within six or eight, Pascal was there with a bucket at the other end. He hit a huge mid-ranger. He had a catch-and-shoot three, hit another mid-ranger, drove on and beat a couple times for finishes. It was just like a brilliant, brilliant performance. 23 points, 10 boards, 7 assists, 10 of 17 overall for Siakam. Uh, What were your impressions of Pascal's game against the Sixers? He didn't score as much as he did on Saturday, but I thought it was every bit as impressive as what he did putting up 34-8-5 in Game 4. Well, if you go back to Game 4... Um, he, I think that was really the first time this series where he was going downhill a lot. He found a lot of driving lanes. He drew a lot of fouls. It's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you want to compare it to like a running back in football where you don't want them going East, West, you want them going North, South. And Pascal did a great job of that and finding and found shooters, but they just weren't making shots in game four. Sure. This game in the third quarter, especially that mid range shot was really falling as you mentioned. And, um, yeah, every time. He was just, he was a huge momentum killer for the Sixers every time. Mm-hmm. 
they were pulling or had a little bit of momentum, he would kill them with a mid-range shot. Uh, like one of those step backs that he's been working on all season and, you know, it's coming to fruition in the playoffs. Uh, and then, yeah, he got by and beat a couple of times and beat had a horrible defensive uh, half. Just a the, nightmare. We're going to yeah, talk about he, him at the end of the show. We're going to yeah. give him some flowers, but my God. Okay. okay. Yeah. Every, everybody was going to work on him. And he mentioned that him, he mentioned that himself after the game that he was horrible defensively. Yeah. But yeah, uh, it was just a perfect mix of you know taking those shot give taking what the defense gave him take, uh, taking those little mid range shots he got inside a couple times he found someone cutting uh, it was a it was a perfect mix and then obviously he's been an incredible two way player over the last few games as well like his mm-hmm. his defense was really on point as well so I mean. This is what we were hoping for from Pascal Siakam because earlier in their series, he was a little bit passive. Uh, and maybe some of that is due to Fred not being there. Like he knows it's on him sure. because, you know, the only other like offensive weapon that teams would really plan for is, you know, maybe to stay stick with Gary at the three point line or deal with OG. It's pretty mm-hmm. much on Pascal to, you know, to, to ride the ship. So I think he, like, without Fred, he, he knows that, and that's really helped his aggressiveness as opposed to him being passive earlier in the series. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I'm really interested to see what happens in game five, if the, or sorry, in game six, if the Sixers alter what they're doing with Siakam, particularly at the top of the pick and roll, where they're not really sending, you know, the second guy, right? They're not hedging high. They're just kind of playing the drop because that's what Joel Embiid typically does. And that killed them in this game. It just the complete blow buys that Siakam was able to get by getting downhill like you mentioned like it just the just caught him flat-footed so many times I'm wondering if maybe they start getting a little bit more aggressive with those double teams at some point you know to try to get the ball out of Pascal's hands because he really is the guy who's making the whole thing flow the problem is is that the few times where they did send extra attention his way he's just so attuned as to where the gravity of him like his own gravity where it's pulling guys from and then finding the guy who's been left available there was the play in the third quarter, kind of at the end of that run of what was it, like seven possessions in a row. Our pal Jay Rosales from Raptors HQ posted a thread, or sorry, a clip of all the seven possessions in a row where they just went at Embiid. And, you know, Siakam, after hitting a bunch of shots, gets close to the rim, Embiid slides over in the help, and then it's just, oh, here, pressure's under the basket, I'm just going to drop it off to him. Like, it's just a really great understanding of everything that the Sixers are trying to do with him. And also, just knowing exactly where the sore spots are everywhere. And there happen to be a lot of them with the Sixers team, right? Like, Mm -hmm. they're hunting out Tyrese Maxey like crazy in a way that they just weren't at the start of the series. And it was driving people insane, myself included, talking about it on this very show. Um, You know, they're looking for George Niang every time he's on the floor. They're looking for Paul Reed and the guy who's going to foul every damn time he gets within three feet of the ball. Um, You know, they're just really, really hunting out all those mismatches. And when Joel Embiid becomes a mismatch to hunt, like... The Sixers are in trouble, man. Like it's it's just yeah. a problem. Um, That's your all NBA think, defender. Yeah, so you know. absolutely, yeah. Um, I, I also am curious what you thought about the way the sort of secondary creators in the game performed for the Raptors in this one. OG brought the ball up a lot, particularly in the first half. It, it seemed like Scotty had his few moments. You know, the the no look lob to Precious, the lob to Thad, the possession before that. Um, you know, what did you think of the sort of complementary playmaking for the Raptors in this one? Because again, I think that's probably going to be something that has to be leaned on even more in Game Six if the Sixers have anything uh, going for them game plan wise. Like they, they they have to try to sell out to stop Siaka more you would think what did you think of the guys who will probably have to step up in those shoes if he is kind of getting harangued by extra limbs in game six on Thursday well if I were the Sixers out especially coming off that high pick and roll I'd probably trap Siaka more especially yeah. when you come to the like when you think of the last couple of games Raptors are only shooting like 25 percent from three yeah even, that's a problem I, I, for Philly too like yeah that, that's gonna I, re that's gonna readjust itself I Exactly. They're kind of due for a breakout three-point shooting game, even though uh, Fred is normally a huge part of that, and right now you don't have him. I still feel like they're due. I even wrote a preview for this game five, and I said that, you know, 
I don't remember the number. I think there were seven for 28. I can't remember. But it was like around 25% in game four. And I said that that's not going to be sustainable on the road. And Mm -hmm. it was. So, (laughs) (laughs) um, but in terms of um, secondary creators, they really began the game going through OG. Um, I think I think it worked well at the beginning when Siakam was out of the game. It kind of bogged down, yeah. but it, it, it kind of gave Siakam a little bit of a rest on the court where he didn't have to do everything all the time. Uh, you mentioned the uh, lobs by Scotty. That was especially huge because um, that was at a time where the, the Sixers were, again, making a little bit of a push uh, early in the fourth, and he found – I think he's a foodie fight. I think he found Thad and Precious on back-to-back lobs. Mm-hmm. So th- that helped a lot in transition. And then um, the other creator uh, over the last couple of games that we've really noticed is um, is Thad Young, uh, yeah. especially when he's in the especially when he's in the post area finding cutters. He was brilliant at this in Game Three. I mean Game Three, Game Four, mm-hmm. and he you know obviously he didn't have as good a game um, uh, yesterday, but. Um, it's kind of one of those games where you can't really look at the uh, the box score with like three points, three assists, but it, yeah. I, I still feel like he was valuable in that sense. So basically um, those four guys are going to be the guys that you hope to create something. I mean, like it's OG that that creation part of his game is still hit or hit or miss, but with um, Scotty and when dad's in the game, I think there can still be some, some secondary creation that they can, you know, lean on. Especially yeah. with Scotty, um, he he, I can't believe he's back and playing already. It's ridiculous when you have like a damn near three hundred pounder <laughs> stepping on your ankle. I mean, just just cre- just credit to him. But yeah, he's gonna look better and better as this series goes along, and it kind of it kind of it's unfortunate because I feel like if he never got hurt, like. That game three where we, you know, how close that game was. Yeah. <laughs> he probably swings the tie. We're probably up three two, but eh, injuries are a part of the game. It is what it is. But I, I'm just really, really impressed with how, you know, I thought he was gonna be done for the series. I didn't think he was coming back. And not yeah. only is he back, he's um he's contributing. So I mean, what more could you want? Totally. Nurse did note after the game that he did see him limping for the first time in the last couple of games, so they're going to monitor it. But there are two days off, so I would feel yes. pretty good about Scotty being good to go for Thursday. And he's pretty essential to what they're doing. Uh, just the last note on the playmaking and just the way the offense kind of picked at all the sore spots. I think, OG, you're right. Like, it's still a little bit of a work in progress, but there are certainly matchups where mm-hmm. he's just got his way, right? Like, Maxi has no chance against him. Niang no. has no chance against him. Like, it, and even, like, like, Harden's done a pretty good job just sort of being thick in the post at times and, and sort of walling off those OG post-ups. But I still think, you know, getting OG going downhill against Harden is not a bad thing um you know and he's done a pretty good job of sort of spraying it out and finding shooters as well so good stuff there I do think you know we saw a little bit of Gary Trent Jr. in the last couple games like kind of getting a little bit more in terms of on-ball reps in uh, you know I I would say more so the first half of this game against the Sixers not so much the second half it was so Siakam centric but uh I'm more all right with Trent kind of being like an off-ball play finisher as opposed to a play creator the decision making is still you know a little bit wonky here and there uh he did make an incredible pass however to Siakam on that three he hit in the third quarter so good for him on that as well but yeah the the more you could just kind of run Trent around with Maxi kind of getting mushed against screens (laughs) I think that's probably where you want Trent operating we're going to continue on and talk about the defense because that was actually probably the star of the show just as much as Pascal Siakam was in this one. They didn't have Fred Van Vliet, and so they leaned fully into the vision. We will talk about how they flummoxed Philly in just one second. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Prize Picks, which uh, has made daily fantasy easy, and it's the playoffs, baby. You want to be doing daily fantasy. You don't have to worry about your season-long league anymore. You're just there every single day. You can, hey, you know, CJ McCollum's playing tonight. All right, let's go make a projection for him and see if we can win some scratch. With prize picks, it's super easy. You pick two to five players and an over-under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times on any entry. It's just you versus the ten, the projected numbers, which is how it should be. There's no shadow expert behind the scenes with a lineup that you're up against that you've not seen before. It's just you against the projections. That is the way daily fantasy should and always has. It really should be for the rest of time, frankly. 
Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Prize Picks is safe and offers fast withdrawals, and you can use the award-winning app in both the App Store and Google Play. Prize Picks offers any prop you can think of from points scored to rebounds, even steals, and you can do mixed sport entries as well. So say on Thursday, you got an afternoon afternoon Blue Jays game and the nighttime Raptors game six, six against the Sixers. Why don't you go on and uh, put a little scratch down on Vlad going over his over for his batting average for the day, and then take a Scotty Barnes over on assists. That sounds like a fun thing to do to me. For a limited time, Prize Picks has an exclusive no-brainer of an offer for all of our users. Uh, you get 50 bucks for free if a player in your first Prize Picks entry scores a single point, but you must use the code NBA. That's right. This is an exclusive offer available to Locked On listeners only. Sign up today. Use the code NBA for $50 for free if a player in your first Prize Picks entry scores a single point. That feels like easy money to me. Go check out our friends over at prize picks and we continue on here with your first listen of the day breaking down the game five win over the sixers for the toronto raptors to send it back to toronto on thursday uh jamar let's dig into the defense shall we the raptors defense in this one was bonkers just completely smothering all over the place it was a just a true delight to behold uh and they had the sixers like the Sixers, I never felt like were going to mount a comeback in this game because of what the Raptors were doing to them defensively. It just felt like they couldn't string together more than two or three possessions of like competent offensive problem solving to get things in motion and get any sort of run together. And it got down to like five, six minutes left in the game. The Raptors are up by like 11. And I'm like, I don't think the Sixers are scoring 11 more points. As it turns out, I don't think they did from the point that I had that take. So, uh, you know, that th- they... they Really, really were bothered once again, and it's not the first time we've seen it. It's kind of three games in a row now we've seen the Raptors' defense really give them problems. They survived Game 3 because of some ridiculous Joel Embiid shot-making down the stretch, but we've seen the last couple games, they're once again daring the Sixers to win via great Joel Embiid shot-making. He's trying to take a lot of threes, a lot of pull-up jumpers, and he's got a bum thumb, and it doesn't seem like it's going to be a viable strategy for them. What did you see from the, from the way the Raptors defended Embiid and the Sixers as a whole last night? Well, this goes back to the regular season, right, where mm-hmm. uh, there was a game in Philadelphia near the end of the season where uh, there was no Fred and there was no OG, and they kind of held Philadelphia around that low 80s, high, I mean, I mean high 80s, low 90s type of score where, mm-hmm. you know, we're kind, of, we're kind of going back to that because to, to be honest, game one's, games one and two were really shocking to me about how bad they were <laughs> defensively. They were letting Tyrese Maxey do whatever the hell he wanted. Um but just the length that the Raptors are throwing at the Sixers right now and the way I want to give uh, Precious a shout out because whether it's rim protection or whether it's if he has to switch out on the perimeter, like mm-hmm. he has just been an amazing defender. The, the growth has been insane on both ends since October. And then, you know, when Chris Boucher is in the game, he's also providing energy and we and weak side protection. It's just like, it feels like the Raptors are back to like not having a weak link on yeah. the defensive end. And um, obviously if Fred was playing, he would, he would be a pest as well. If he was healthy, you know, digging down and, 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 cre- and creating havoc. You saw that he couldn't even really defend anymore at uh, uh, in the game four when he had to come out the game and rip his Jersey and whatnot. Yeah. But uh, between Pascal between Precious. It's just, I don't know who's been their best defender. They've just, they've covered up everything. And uh, Embiid mentioned it after the game about, you know, I think too, I think too much has been on him to create. Uh, Harden took 11 shots and Embiid was asked about that. And he's basically said that, Oh, give it to me. Give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> he basically said that, you know, he's he needs Harden to be himself. He needs Harden yeah. to be, you know, the, 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 the Houston James Harden, basically. I don't know mm-hmm. if that Harden's coming back because yeah. uh, it's kind of been swept under the rug because the Sixers were up 3 nothing. But if he's not doing the step back threes, he's not really going anywhere. Um, yeah. He, I mean... His he can't finish at the rim like he used to. He's shooting under thirty. He's shooting under forty percent in the series. He's actually shooting better from three than he is from the field. 
So that kind of that kind of proves my point. And you know, even the other day, it was like like Malachi Flynn was stonewalling him. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah, he, I feel like if the Sixers are going to win another game in this series, they need like a twenty five plus point game from Harden. It, he can't just be the facilitator guy. And you know, take a shot every so often because that's too much pressure on Embiid, especially with his um, with his dumb. So Tobias Harris, to his credit, has been extremely consistent this series. I thought he was going to be the X factor of the series because you know, uh, in the 2019 playoffs against us, he, he was you know really bad. So I just yeah. felt like you know he's going to be the guy that the Raptors don't pay that much attention to with dealing with Maxi's quickness and Embiid and Harden. So to his credit, he's been really good, but. Harden's going to have to be a lot more so kind of like what I was thinking about Pascal uh, earlier yeah. in the series. He's going to have to be like, be a lot more sort of, and that's why I was annoyed in the first couple of games in Philadelphia when the Raptors were, were basically ball watching Harden and, yeah. sent, and a second guy was like kind of creeping over and he, and obviously he's a really good passer and he would just deliver a rocket pinpoint pass to Niang or Danny green or Tobias. And it's just like, we don't need to send so much attention to Harden. This is not the Houston James Harden. We don't need to do that. Um, let him prove that he can get to the paint without yeah. drawing some BS foul or hooking someone's arm or some crap like that. Let him prove that he can do that before uh, throwing all this attention to him. And the Raptors have done that a lot less. And basically, he's deferred. And yeah. it's going to be, you know, and with him be kind of like, calling him call, not like aggressively calling him out but making it known that he needs to take more shots i'm really interested to see what type of james harden we're gonna get in game six because now now the slander is gonna be back you know <laughs> because you know it was quiet for a while it was quiet for a while but the sixers were up three nothing so who cares it kind of got swept under the rug like i said but mm -hmm. now it the, the pressure where everybody was like oh you know, there's more pressure on you than anybody in the in the playoffs and blah blah blah. That's going to be back for Game Six, and that's why I call Game Five a chaos game because it's just like if you lose this game, all the pressure's on you. I mean, cause the Raptors are playing with house money; they're playing with house yeah. money, and they still are. So it's going to be interesting. I, I want to see how I want to see what type of James Harden we're getting, and you know, obviously, depending on that, we'll see how the Raptors' defense deals with that. Yeah, he's 9 of 28 from the field over the last two games. I, I think, like, that's just not good enough. And, I mean, even beyond this series, if the Sixers do survive this, like, you can't feel good if you're a Sixers fan about your chances of getting by Miami in the next round. Like, just doesn't seem like it's going to happen if you don't have Harden going at the sort of the, the level that they thought they were getting when they traded for James Harden. Like, it's just, it's not working out. And the thing that, you know, I mentioned the Raptors just kind of know where all the sore spots are and, 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 you know, Pascal can go in ISO and, and pull the switch for anybody that he wants. Like, you can't do that with James Harden on the Raptors because there's no one to, to pinpoint. He can't even get by Gary Trent Jr. all the time right now. Like, the odd time he'll get by him with the left, sure, but he's also kind of being granted that left-hand finish whenever he wants against the Raptors because they know it's the least damaging way for a Sixers offensive possession to kind of, you know, take place over the course of 24 seconds. It's just, he's not that dude right now. It's, not, it's reductive and all that, but, like, he, he's not able to find those mismatches that he used to be so good at. Like, the entire backbone of the Houston Rockets team that nearly beat the Warriors in the conference finals in 2018 was, we're just going to ISO everybody, and we're going to play mismatch basketball. We have the best mismatch basketball guys on hand in the world. And it worked. It was really effective. They probably win that series if not for Chris Paul's injury. That he's just not in that space anymore, and the Raptors are particularly a difficult team. Like, he can't even fake it against the Raptors because there's just length and arms and, you know, great side-to-side -side lateral quickness in front of him whenever he tries to size something up. Even the pull-up threes and the step-backs are with Scotty Barnes just, like, kind of draped over him or whoever it might be. It's a really difficult way for them to subsist, and I, I honestly, you know, I, I said before the game yesterday when we did the podcast with Vivek, like... I don't think the Raptors are a better team without Fred Van Vliet in a vacuum, but I do think they're probably a little bit better suited to beat this Sixers team without him in this series 
because of the sort of diminished state he'd been in and the fact that he was kind of that one sore spot you could go at, whether you're Maxi or you're Harden, and you can try to blow by him, and you're probably going to because he just doesn't have the quickness right now because he's so banged up. And now you take Fred out, and it's just more length, more arms, and just an impenetrable wall. They really, like, their best avenue to offense right now is still dumping into Embiid, and then hopefully he can spray a pass out to somebody for a three. But, like, Harden's not eager to take those threes. Maxi is getting run off the line and then just walking into a second line of defense and throwing up all these doomed floaters these last couple games. And you're really just kind of hoping, like, can Danny Green and Tobias Harris kind of save the day for us? Like... It's a lot to ask of those two guys. Harris has been awesome. Like, credit to him. He's been great on both ends and has been a real thorn in the side of the Raptors in this series. But, Mm -hmm. like, I don't know, other than just, like, making a concerted effort to get Embiid that deep post position where he can just kind of be seven foot two and impossible to stop once he kind of gets within the sort of restricted area. Other than that, there's not really an easy pathway to offense for the Sixers right now, and it's because the Raptors are so freaking dialed in. It's just beautiful basketball to watch, man. As much as they're ugly on offense and kind of grimy and playing the type of game that the quants really don't like, uh, the defense is, like, the polar opposite in terms of beauty, and it's been just a treat. Uh, any last thoughts here on the defense? Any particular guys you want to highlight before we uh, start to thank some Sixers for their work in the game last night in the final segment? <laughs> uh, I think we I think we covered it. Or basically, there isn't a weak link right now on the defensive end, and yeah. even when even when Dad and Boucher and guys like that come off the bench, uh, you know, I, I think I think oh, actually, you know what? I want to give a shout out to uh, Ken Birch because yeah, the first. In the first quarter, uh, he was re- he was pretty good on, on on both ends, and he he made a he made a three. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's he's not got the, two that's, threes that's not the, in this yeah. series now. I mean, he didn't make one all year. <laughs> exactly, he didn't make one all season. I mean that's not a defensive comment, but I just want to give him a little bit of sh- uh, of a shout out regards to that because yeah. a lot of people think that you know he's basically starting just to you know eat up some fouls. And so that you don't have a, a precious or a Pascal or OG in foul trouble off the jump, sure. And and you know the the, the offense kind of tailed off in the third quarter, and then they subbed him out. But I thought he really provided some solid minutes, so I just gave him a little bit of a shout out. Yeah, the first half run from Birch was awesome, and I think you make a really good point in that. Yeah, maybe he is just kind of in there to soak up fouls, but. That's a useful and valuable thing to have right now when you're as thin as the Raptors are. They really only have eight guys in the rotation they're going to trust. You know, it makes sense for the guy who, A, is probably most physically capable outside of Precious of guarding Embiid. Makes sense to start with him so you're not getting off on the wrong foot and sort of artificially suppressing guys' minutes as the game goes along. And then, you know, perhaps by then you've got Embiid a little bit tired, which we will talk about in just one second, among other things that the Sixers did to help the Raptors' cause in this one. We'll get to that in just one second. But first, I want to tell you about our friends over at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your sports betting stats and info. Find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, injury reports, Reports news, including this year's basketball playoffs and the Major League Baseball season, all covered for you with podcasts, articles, and everything you might need to become the informed wagerer. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering info. You've got live betting, you've got esports, you've got Vegas casino games, and so much more. Head to the website today. Use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action. Bet Online is where the game starts. And we continue on and round out. Your first listen of the day here with some uh, thoughts on some Sixers who uh, really helped the Raptors cause in this one. We'll start with one guy who won't be there for Thursday because of vaccination laws. It is Matisse Thibel, who last night goes one of six. His only bucket was a bucket that Scotty Barnes and Precious Achua tapped in for him after trying to collect a rebound. Uh... I don't think you could really overstate the degree to which Thibel was damaging for the Sixers in this one. Kind of wish he was able to play on Thursday. Seen all the jokes about t- you know tweeting at Justin Trudeau to get him to change the laws by then. <laughs> Not only is it going to happen, but uh, you know he was actively terrible for Philly in this game. Kind yeah. of lends credence to the idea that I you know before the series I didn't think the whole absence of Thibel was going to be that big a deal for the Sixers. In fact, it might actually help them going forward here, even though they are quite thin. Um, what were your thoughts on Thibel last night? And, uh, you know, obviously he won't be there for those sort of offensive failed possessions where he's just throwing the ball away to Scotty Barnes for no reason on Thursday. Um, you know, do you think it's damaging to the Raptors' chances of winning for him not to be there now? I mean, 
he's like you said, he's not really a big factor in this series either way. Yeah. It, it, it when the and the Sixers blow out wins in games one and two, honestly, he was kind of invisible as is. Yeah. So it, it, like he's really had no impact on the series. It's like the first time he was really noticeable was last night. And yeah, yeah it, it, I wish we could just you know disguise and smuggle him in or something like that. But um, you know he's he's a guy that you can lay off of, and he's not making any shots right now. I think him basically doing the whole Kyrie part time thing for this series has kind of hurt him because I don't think he's in any sort of rhythm. Um, and then defensively, obviously he had that's you know. That, that that's his thing defensively he's supposed to be a great defender he's an all nba defender but i really don't feel like he's done much in that aspect either where he's real like i haven't really seen any real possessions where it's like okay matisse Thibel really you know really stopped the raptors on this play i mean like he's mm-hmm. just kind of been there it's like he's just getting cardio in like I haven't, <laughs> he's just getting his cardio in, man, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna miss that. I'm gonna miss that. I look forward to, I look forward to seeing useless Matisse Thibault minutes in Game Seven. I'm already saying that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, the thing with Thibault is like he had one stretch in this game where I thought he was pretty helpful to Philly. Because at the start of the second quarter, the Raptors were having a lot of trouble breaking into the zone because he was at the top of the zone just being long and annoying. You know, lots of deflected passes. There were a couple of steals that were kind of incited by his presence at the top with Siakam kind of trying to size him up and, you know, dig into the zone through him. Not an easy thing to do, of course. But, you know, he gave all of that back pretty quickly on the offensive end with, you know, and you could see it. The Raptors just clear out whatever he's about to shoot. It's like, oh, well, we can go rebound now because he's pulling up (laughs) from the baseline from 18 feet. No problem. We'll just create a sphere of no no touching Thibel for like 10 feet around him and then go get the board. Um, You know, I, I, I thought he, you know, he does offer that sort of resistance at the point of the zone. But like the Sixers zone has been getting torched in this series as well. Like the Raptors have figured it out. They're not doing it by bombing threes. They're doing it from flashing to the middle and figuring it right. out from there. And, you know, as much as they're sort of good in their sort of original stance in the zone, once you get it moving, they've just com- been completely useless in that in that format. So, like, again, that's going to be, a, I think, a, an adjustment that Doc Rivers has to make as well. Probably just, like, abandoning the zone for good, even though the Raptors don't have a lot of shooting on hand. They're figuring it out anyway. Like, they're going to have to really alter up their coverages. And, again, I think we're going to see a lot of doubling Pascal Siakam, especially with no thigh out there to kind of play, um, you know, the sort of on-ball role anymore, right? Like, and it's not like he does much on ball against Siakam anyway. He's just been pretty ineffectual. Uh, another guy who was not so good last night was Joel Embiid. We should dig in a little bit more to where the sort of uh, <laughs> the melting down of Joel Embiid took place in this game. He was really, really rough. Like, what are you more concerned about now if you're a Sixers fan? The fact that his thumb is busted and he's like not really shooting effectively from distance, like he's really only really effective when he gets kind of in the teeth of the defense in those situations, carves out that space. But like the threes aren't falling for him right now. Ever since game three, really, when when he had the biggest three of the series so far. Um, or are you more concerned about his inability to stay in front of freaking precious Achua? Like where where are you at? Um, if you're a Sixers fan, you know what are you most concerned about? Maybe it's just all of it with Embiid right now. I'm more concerned on the offensive end with him beat than the defensive yeah. end because I mean, I mean he looked gassed. Uh, they have an extra day off. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I mean, in just given his track record of being an All NBA defender, I don't think we're gonna have another montage like that again and just like a stretch where everybody, literally everybody, is getting by him like a turnstile. I, I don't think we're gonna see that again to that extent. But the offensive problems, and he's talking, and now he's you know he's talking about his thumb every every game. It's like yeah. it's like the opposite of Kyle Lowry, where uh, you know th- there was very little coverage on that. The only time where you, you saw anything regarding Lowry's thumb is when he was you know going from point A to point B, and you would see it all, <laughs> and you would see that huge like was like a mitten or something or wrapped up yeah in some his little oven way. mitt yeah 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 no yeah that's the that's only in the hall ro- of fame now by the way yeah or it should be yeah <laughs> that's the only coverage but you know between being sick in the 2019 uh playoffs and now with the thumb and bead's gonna talk about whatever's ailing him a lot that's just yeah. what he does so 
I'm more concerned on the offensive end if I'm a Sixers fan. And that's why I brought up Harden a little bit earlier. And that's why he brought up Harden last yeah. night because he, he, I think he knows that he's not going to be able to do what he does offensively as well. So that's why he wants the help from Harden. So definitely the offensive end. The defense, he, I think he'll fix that because yeah. he acknowledged he acknowledged how bad he was. And I'm sure he's going to be a lot more locked in in that sense. But the offense, I, I don't know. He's going to need help. Maxi, yeah. Harden, somebody. Yeah, for sure. And, like, I mean, it really is wild how this series swung just on the Raptors' decision to take Trent or Fred off of Maxi and have, like, one of Siakam or OG kind of always on him and then to just single cover Harden, right? Like, the adjustments in this series, at least to my eye, there obviously are smaller things probably going on on a every possession basis that I'm not picking up because I'm not a coach. But in terms of like the stuff that's like big picture, the way the game is being played, the flow of the game that's been altered, like that switch really seems to have completely neutered the the Sixers' offense, right? Like there's just not a whole lot they're generating, and. You know, again, I don't know how they go about getting Embiid into those sort of deep post spots. Again, the Raptors are doing such a good job of picking him up early in the floor, forcing him to work from the free throw line and out. Like, it's been really, really impressive to see. But, like, at some point, dude, you're 7'3", man. Like, you can probably find your way to the bucket here. Um, and, you know, he keeps on turning it over when those doubles come, too. I mean, the double teams have just been ridiculous. Pascal has been just a menace with those flying over from awkward angles and making it so the passes are not ever, ever able to go to the guys that... Embiid wants them to go to it's like well I guess I'm passing to Matisse Thibel in the corner um I wonder if he got an assist on that uh the bucket that Precious and Scotty yeah. tapped back in I, <laughs> no. I guess you got to give it to him I suppose it was That'd a Matisse be, bucket but man right, um man. yeah brutal either way uh yeah I, I'm pretty concerned about Embiid if I'm a Sixers fan right now just the way that his thumb seems to be very clearly bothering him and honestly the way he keeps bringing it up it's giving me shades of every time Dwayne Casey mentioned game one and the tip-ins at the end of the game one against the Cavs in 2018. Like, he mentioned it after every single game. Well, if it weren't for game one, if it weren't for game one, if it weren't for the thumb, it seems problematic to me. Uh, I, I, I've seen demons, uh, you know, sort of percolate over the course of a playoff series before from the other side of it and uh, seems troublesome right now. Uh, any last parting shots on the series as it heads back to Toronto on Thursday, Jamar? Any predictions? Any thoughts on uh, you know how the Raptors can get this thing all the way back to Philly for Game Seven? Well, I mean, Game Six, everybody's going to be ready for. Um, mm -hmm. Just nope, the fan. I hope the fans will be ready, and if they if they jump on them, that could be a blowout. If, that could be a blowout if they jump on them. And yeah. one thing we know about Doc Rivers' teams, they get worse as the series goes on. Like there's yeah. a massive track record of this where they, they, they all come out like gangbusters in the beginning of a series. I'm like, okay, just, just wait, just wait for the game by game, <laughs> you know, adjustments or lack thereof. And even uh, Paul George called them out for that uh, mm -hmm. after the day blew that uh, three, one lead to the nuggets in the bubble. But yeah, I mean, he's really slow when it comes to that. And, I just I feel like game if if the Raptors just have a good start like for example this, this game that we just watched the only time Philly led was two nothing after that yep. it was all Raptors yep. and I feel like if the Raptors get out to a similar good start with the crowd behind them and if Harden is not doing any more that could be a blowout and then that will really have everybody on edge going into going going into Game Seven like that that would be crazy. But um, as far as Doc is concerned, I mean, like, I feel really confident about this 3-0 thing now. I really do. I mean, it's the <laughs> it's only... It's wild, the confidence Doc Rivers' teams inspire in and the even coming into this, And <laughs> even coming into this game, I was just like, hey, man, we can win this. I mean, and... I, I gave a shout out to everybody on my um my my timeline because it's just like I didn't see one pessimistic comment about how you know oh the series is over blah 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 mm -hmm. we got our one game we're gonna get gentlemen uh, gentlemen swept blah, blah blah I didn't see any of that it's just like everybody knew that this kind of chaos was in the making and yeah. you know it's the only thing missing from Doc's uh, bucket list he's blown numerous three two leads he's blown three three one leads the most <laughs> in NBA history I mean. It's 3-0. 
that's the, that's the only thing left on the bucket list. And it to me, it's right there for the taking, man. I mean, there I don't see a possible way where the Raptors are down like double digits in game six. Like, yeah. And even and even if they are, we've seen the Raptors even going down the stretch of the regular season where they would always start slow and f- and make their way back in the game. I don't want to see that. I don't want to. I don't want to see that with a winner go home type of situation. But yeah, I don't want no fake comebacks going on here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, but um, I just just get off to a good start again and and let the and let the crowd carry you. Let the defense carry you. The, the, there'll probably be an offensive drought here and there. But I really feel confident about Game Six, and then when we get to Game Seven, who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Uh, but Barkley had a hilarious comment about um, <laughs> Spinter's tightening t- tight up in Game Seven, or he's just, or he's just shaking his head, like I, I, I can't with you guys. <laughs> yeah, but something like that, man. I mean, it's wild the sort of total polar opposite this team kind of has in terms of like tone and tenor against like. You know, think back to 2017 or 18 when the team was just like completely despondent whenever LeBron would do one thing mean to them. Uh, and it like completely broke them. Like, th- this is mm-hmm. an entirely different sort of vibe. I mean, you got the championship sort of, you know, lingering with, you know, Fred and Pascal and OG and Boucher and stuff like that. But like, they're just, they're bastards in the best kind of way, man. They're just <laughs> bastards in like, and I would not want to be playing them, would not want to be uh, sort of staring down the barrel of blowing a 3 0 lead against them because. Like, Nick Nurse has said it, and I don't want to come off as the homer, but, like, someone does have to do it at some point, right? Like, this was the thing in the NHL for the longest time. No right. one had come back from down 3-0. There have been, like, three of those in the past 10 years. Like, things, uh, you know, th- 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 things that had not ha- happened yet are meant to happen at some point in most cases. So, uh, we'll see. I-, I do think, you know, I made the point after, honestly, you know, I-, I felt this in Game 3, definitely after Game 4. The Raptors have figured this matchup out and what works for them. The Sixers, it's very much on them. Like, the onus is clearly on Doc Rivers and the Sixers to adjust back and figure out something. Maybe that comes in the form of extra attention for Siaka. Maybe it's something else we haven't foreseen just yet. Maybe Furkan Korkmaz comes in and goes nuts. Uh, but I, I really think... Yeah, he gets like, the Sixers, defensively. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really think it's on the Sixers here to sort of figure out this matchup because as it stands right now, the Raptors know exactly how to butter their own bread and how to deny the butter off of the toast of the Sixers as well. Um, by the way, prediction, I think we're going to see DeAndre Jordan in Game 6, and I'm going to laugh extremely hysterically <laughs> if it happens. Uh, but Paul Reed looked real bad last night and uh, hey. not up for whatever the Raptors are trying to do to him and the Sixers right now. So give me DeAndre, baby. Hey, you you know what that brings me to? Um, The last, I think it was at the end of the regular season. Did you see that uh, presser with Doc and how extremely condescending he was towards reporters? Of course I did. Poor Derek Bodner. We love Derek Bodner. One of the best Sixers writers there is. Yeah, well, why why DeAndre Jordan was getting minutes? He's like, when they go big, use DeAndre Jordan. We go small. (laughs) Oh, man. And he was just lying. Like, Paul Reed hadn't (laughs) played at all against small lineups. He was just doing lies. It's unbelievable. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, the vibes seem extremely toxic and sour there in Philly. I I think you're very much justified to be feeling quite good today if you are a Raptors fan. Still lots of work to be done here. They're only halfway right. there. They mm-hmm. still would have to go through a Game 7 in Philly, which, uh, you know, we know the sort of wild swings that crowd can have from what we saw last night and to, you know, what we've seen when things go well. Uh, but man, they're on the right track in Game 6. I think you should feel pretty good about considering how this series has trended so far. That will do it for today. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. Really appreciate it. We'll be back again tomorrow. Uh, so tomorrow, Thursday, in some order, we're going to do a mailbag episode where I'll just take your questions about the series, and then I'm going to try to connect with Keith and Devon from Locked On Sixers for another crossover, sort of a mid-series, tee-up game six type of thing. So keep an eye out for that. Not sure the scheduling of when those are going to take place just yet, but those will be your next two episodes. And of course, Friday, we will break down, actually... Thursday night from the arena, we'll do another live show. It will be your Friday podcast, but we'll do a live post-game reaction show on Thursday from Scotiabank Arena. So subscribe to the YouTube channel and set a reminder uh, so you don't miss any of those live shows when they fire up. And uh, Jamar, anything you would like to promote before we get out of here? Yeah, I am doing a pre- I've been doing a preview for every single game on Raptors Republic. And um, hey, man, Toronto, Philly, it's destined to go seven. 
<laughs> Every single se- the, the, the last two series went seven, and some epic shit happened. And whatever way it goes, I feel like we're on the same we're on the same track. But yeah, uh, I've been doing I've been doing a preview for every game, um, and I just I just love how the preview for game five basically came to fruition. Where I'm just like, you know what, man, <laughs> this is the chaos game, and we'll, we'll just watch and see what happens after the Sixers lose that game, and basically everything I said hap- everything I said happened. So um, just check out my previews on Raptors for Public. Um, I haven't really had any time to do any um, recaps or things like that. Um, Lewis and and Sam and Sam Folk have done a great job of that. Yeah. But that's where you can check out my work. Um, you can follow me at Jamar BH at the screen under you. Um, and that's all I got. Hell yeah, man. Jamar, you do wonderful work. One of the like the true meteoric rises of any Raptors writer this season, I think. You've just been kicking ass all year long. Everyone go follow Jamar. You, more people should be following Jamar. It's <laughs> ridiculous that they're not. So go do it now. Uh, that will do it for today. Thank you very much. We'll be back again tomorrow with another episode of Locked on Raptors. Go make your second listen of the day. Locked on NBA as they are breaking down uh, what the Sixers did not do to prevent the Raptors <laughs> from getting back. It's, it's a lot of like, hey, why, why are the Sixers uh, you know, poop in the bed so bad. I'll be sure to text the guys who host that show and get some Raptors propaganda in there as well. Either way, we'll talk to you again tomorrow with another episode of Locked On Raptors. Bye bye. <laughs>